All right. Today is Sunday, September 26th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you and a long one tonight, which is what I tell my wife every night. And she says, no, thanks. Anyways, the market is still in this orgasm mode. The dip buyers, the bulls slash pigs would say this week, the week that was. Everything got thrown at the market this week, including the kitchen sink. From the Evergrande crisis to perhaps the advance warning for tapering to the crypto crackdown by the Chinese government and the market, guess what? Bounced back and closed in the green. So what is the big deal here? What's the problem? On the other hand, we have other people saying that perhaps this is a dead cat bounce. And we don't trust the rebound. There is something bigger brewing over here. And this one will be different. So why don't we debate all of these issues? And here it is in focus tonight. We're going to have a bull versus bear debate. Then we're going to talk about the wall of worry and the new item, the black swan. Lastly, we're going to talk about the Dow theory and how it applies to today's market. When it comes to the bull to bear debate, the bulls would say, wait a minute here, we had a rough week, more specifically a rough day on Monday, but the dips were bought, the Fed remains accommodative, and inflation will be transitory. Oh, and by the way, on Friday, the VIX got crushed once again, so we have crushed the VIX Fridays, those are back, and we have plenty of cash on the sidelines to buy the dips, billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars. The bears will counter by saying that the technicals are broken this time around and the Fed will be forced to tighten because inflation will not be transitory. Matter of fact, tra inflation is not transitory. The Fed itself is admitting that inflation is not transitory. On top of that, we have market internals broken. Yes, the market appears that it's trading higher and higher and higher, but it looks like the Titanic as it sinks because we have more names getting shot week by week by week and the market is getting weaker and weaker and weaker when it comes to the internals, which nobody's paying attention to, at least for now. And lastly, we have the wall of worry. We can put band-aids on all of these items, but the wall of worry hasn't been addressed or resolved yet. And that leads us to, you guessed it, the wall of worry. We have tapering, we have China, the debt crisis, the Biden administration, the Delta variant, and then we have the risk of margin calls. And here is the newest item, the black swan. We start with the risk of tapering. Of course, the Fed says we're going to taper soon. Soon can be November, December, January, 2023, 2024, 2030, depends. AKA, we're not going to taper unless we're forced to taper. And here is the data supporting the forced to taper argument. For example, in the United Kingdom, we are now having the risk of stagflation, not just in the United States, but in the UK, European countries, South American countries, and now we have even Asian countries warning of the risk of stagflation because the economy is cooling down, the economy is slowing down while prices continue to rise higher and higher and higher. And perhaps this couldn't be more evident than the recent earnings calls from Costco, FedEx, and Nike all warning about the risk of stagflation. Of course, we have one name that is stagflationary in these three, which is Costco. Therefore, Costco actually traded higher after the earnings call. Meanwhile, Nike and FedEx went down. Costco will be one of the last blocks to fall because it is a stagflationary stock. But we have FedEx, for example, warning that they will have to reroute over 600,000 packages a day because they're having a problem with staffing the labor shortage. And by the way, even Costco said, we don't trust the Fed. We don't trust that this inflation will be transitory. And we are treating this inflation as not transitory, meaning jacking up prices as much as we can. Therefore, Costco's margins improving and the stock shot up higher because the consumer will have no choice at all but to pay the extra cost. And we have more data now supporting stagflation, specifically from the housing market. The transanistas say, wait till the supply shows up and then prices will go down and the problem with inflation will go away and therefore inflation is transitory. Well, we got the news that the housing supply is at 13-year high 
meaning the supply is surging, but our price is responding by diving down. Of course not. The median new house price shot up 20.1% in August to $390,000 from a year ago, while prices were unchanged on a monthly basis. Last month, new home sales remain concentrated in the 200,000 to 750,000 price range. So again, the supply is surging, but prices are not going down. Why? Because demand is not slowing down. Why? Because we have the Fed printing money out of thin air, stalking that demand higher and higher and higher. We have legendary economist Milton Friedman who told us that there is no such thing as supply push inflation and therefore the increase in supply doesn't mean anything at all so long as the Fed continues to print and expanding their balance sheet higher and higher and higher until and unless the Fed stops printing prices will continue to linger higher regardless of the increase in supply because inflation is always always a monetary phenomenon and even the fed sees inflation now lasting quite a while it went from transitory to quite a while whatever that means and of course the propagandists over the media they're never going to tell you the truth their main objective is to cheerlead for the biden administration for example read this headline americans were freaking out over inflation this spring they aren't anymore and it shows they believe in the Biden economy. Really, this is garbage. Absolute garbage from the filth of the media. What do you say when the consumer says, we have the worst buying conditions since the 1980s? Is this faith in the Biden administration and so-called Biden economy? Of course not. But they continue to downplay the risk of inflation. Why? Because their guy's in power now. Last year, they were screaming over and over and over at the top of their lungs, inflation, inflation, inflation. Now that their guy's in power, what inflation? Inflation is going to be transitory. If they're going to be fine, this is the filth and the garbage that we call the mainstream media. What about the risk from China? And ever grand? Well, we have a band-aid for now on that because the Chinese government decided to inject over 18 billion dollars into the financial system for now so we have a band-aid for now of course the risk is that we're going to hear more crackdown from the chinese government the question is who are they going to crack down against next we also have the debt crisis what's going on with that one we have the biden administration the white house saying or telling federal agencies to prepare for a shutdown it's a joke until it's not because everybody have this hyper bullish sentiment yes they talk about the debt ceiling and the risk of shutdowns pretty much every single year and at the end of the day they come up to an agreement because they have to what if they don't this time around because the disagreements are huge the parties are far away we have divisions within the same party from uh, Mnuchin and Mnuchin Mansion and Cinema and the rest they're not supporting the budget plan by the Democrats and the clock is ticking now the Treasury has about 200 to 300 billion dollars in the extraordinary measures they're gonna run out of money and they're running out of time we'll see what happens next week but this will be front and center if we don't have a resolution by this upcoming week what about the debacles from the biden administration well the immediate risk to the market is the risk of taxation and trade wars but the debacles continue and you can bet on more debacles to come of course the president continues to stun everybody by refusing to answer questions from reporters over and over and over again we have the propaganda minister saki says why do you need that information why do you need to ask questions have you forgotten that we live in north korea and of course perhaps the trade deal between the us and the uk will not happen after all because we now have disagreements regarding northern ireland and the latest debacle of course biden met with the indian prime minister and he said have you heard about the bidens in india Come on, man. And the Indian guy was, what is this person talking about? And of course, we found out that the Bidens in India were actually former colonizers and not looking good at all. What about the risk from Delta and the virus? Well, cases are peaking for now. And we have the CDC, NIH, the WHO stumbling all over the place regarding the boosters, who gets the boosters, who doesn't get the boosters, the CDC overruling the previous ruling and giving the frontline workers access to boosters 
it's a mess all over the place. Misinformation all over the place. But when it comes to the market, what matters is, number one, bad news is good news. So long as Delta continues to rise, then the Fed has an excuse to continue to print and remain so-called accommodative. But if Delta cases are peaking, as they're doing right now, then the assumption is the next jobs report, perhaps in September or October, will be decent. And Powell says, I don't need to see a blockbuster jobs report. I just need to see a decent one to start tapering meaning beating expectations from so-called economists. So when it comes to the virus, once again, good news is bad news. Bad news is good news. And now we're shifting from bad news regarding the virus to good news. We're peaking and we're making significant progress when it comes to the vaccinations. And therefore, the bad news from Delta is becoming good news and therefore bad news for the market because the market cares about one thing, the co Kane coming from the Fed. What about the risk of margin calls? Well, this risk is still here, but it will not be evident to the market until we have a serious and lasting correction, meaning the market drops 5% or more and it stays there. And the correction goes from 5% to 10%. And then we're going to see margin calls heading and the market will flush down 15, 20% on margin calls alone. Of course, that leads me to the black swan because the Bill Wong disaster, the Archegos disaster came from a so-called family office. Nobody knew it wasn't on anybody's radar. Of course, I shorted Viacom right at the top, but my theory was technical in nature, not related to Bill Wong or Archegos. I had no clue at all that we even had something like this hiding in plain sight because family offices have no obligations at all to report what they're doing. They're playing in the dark, yet they're accumulating risk because we have a tsunami of liquidity in the banking system and banks have to get rid of that excess liquidity. The repo facilities are not enough, so they have to lend the money out. Are they going to lend it to small businesses, to regular folks? Of course not, because lending conditions are becoming more stringent, but they're not so stringent when it comes to hedge funds and so-called family offices. So do we have another hidden disaster? The likes of Archegos Capital, but even bigger that we're not aware of, we'll see. But when it comes to the black swan, what am I talking about? Am I talking about North Korea bombing somebody or Iran? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about any of that. Trust me, if North Korea accidentally nukes somebody, the market will go higher because the market cares about nothing but the coke. And if we have some international disaster, the Fed will say we have to remain accommodative because we have uncertainty in the global arena. What I'm talking about is a market-related mechanical black swan that is hiding in plain sight or we're not paying attention to that at all. Perhaps the most frequent question that I get in this channel is, when will the crash happen? The answer is, if I know when the crash is going to happen, I wouldn't be doing this channel. I would be hiding in a bunker somewhere, being busy becoming the richest man on the planet. But we we all know how the movie is going to end. This is the most obvious scenario. The Fed ushered the tsunami of liquidity as an excuse to battle the COVID-19 crisis. In doing so, the Fed enabled the risk on mode on steroids. And we have retail investors and institutionals alike taking risk more than ever before. And the level of debt, corporate margin, consumer debt, the debt to GDP ratio through the roof or the roof, as some people would say. So we have a massive stash of risk, the biggest stash in the history of financial markets, the biggest stash in the history of humanity, a stash as big as the tallest peak in the planet, Mount Everest. And we know this is at least the obvious assumption on how the bubble will bust. The Fed will have to tighten in response to rising inflation. Perhaps inflation will not be transitory, is not transitory, and the Fed will not only have to taper, but it will have to raise interest rates rates abruptly and therefore throwing a massive grenade on that stash and we're going to have a massive explosion and goodbye stock market, goodbye economy. But what if I told you that perhaps the obvious explanation of how the bubble will end isn't what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about is what's hiding in plain sight and we're not paying attention to right now. What am I talking about? Remember, we have a massive stash the biggest stash of risk in human history. We're waiting and waiting and waiting for the stash to light up on fire. This will be the end of the stock market and the end of the global economy. But 
The Fed is trying a cute trick here by increasing the repo purchasing program, aka the vacuum machine, because their approach to the resolution of this bubble is we have to reduce the stash little by little by little, gradually, and then we light a smaller stash on fire by tightening, and therefore we're not going to have this scenario of a global economic crash or a massive stock market crash. It will be contained. Of course, the Fed lives in a pipe dream because what if we have a hidden accelerator hiding in that stash? And the Fed, of course, after using the vacuum machine to reduce the stash, they will try to light up controlled fires. Pay attention now. Controlled fires, little by little by little, to reduce the stash of risk. Meaning a little match, a little contained fire, little tapering here and there. And this gradual process will reduce the stash and we're going to avoid the scenario of a massive stock market crash and a massive global crash. But if we have a hidden accelerator hiding in the stash, then these small controlled fires Fires, via tapering and tightening slightly by the Fed will light up this accelerator on fire and all of a sudden surprisingly the entire stash will catch up on fire and it will be the biggest economic disaster the biggest market disaster that we have ever seen what is the accelerator this is what I keep thinking about every day every night before I sleep when I'm in the shower I'm thinking about what am I missing here where is the hidden accelerator because number one if you can point that out you can avoid the tragedy you can save the planet literally on the other hand if the disaster happens knowing that accelerator if you short the accelerator it will be the short trade of a lifetime for example back in the housing bubble the housing crash 2007 2009 that led to the financial crash by the way we had dr michael burry the big short all what he did is look into something on surface the mortgage bond market was pristine no risk at all because who's not going to pay the mortgage and all of these mortgage bonds are triple a's great fico scores no risk at all the problem is this racket been going on for years and years and years and at some point you're going to run out of good mortgages to bundle in these mortgage-backed securities and therefore they started to add riskier mortgages and they called them subprime mortgages the subprime mortgages did not reduce the credit rating of the bond so again on surface it looked hunky-dory but when you look in the details there are hidden bombs inside these bonds because it is a pyramid scheme operation at some point you're gonna run out of good mortgages and you're gonna have to add bad mortgages and then when you bundle the bad mortgages all together and you change the product to cdos meaning you're selling garbage absolute filth worth nothing at all but when you bundle all that together all of a sudden you have a tradable product with good credit rating of course michael burry looked into the details he found out the accelerator the risk of defaults within these so-called pristine bonds he shorted these bonds and he became filthy rich and we got the global economic crisis in 2008 2009 the collapse of lehman etc 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 now we know that the hidden accelerator is not in the housing market right now because supposedly we have learned from the past and banks have been stringent on new mortgages the fico scores etc etc but the simple premise is where there is excess there is a collapse once again where there is excess there is a collapse the hidden accelerator is here but nobody's paying attention to it what is it i'm still looking but i'm running out of time there are many ideas and it goes back to bundling of course for example the fed ushers the tsunami of liquidity retail investors go bananas and they buy the shittiest companies the shittiest stocks they score a lot of gains the equity value of these shitty stocks go higher and guess what these shitty companies with shitty stocks they take out loans they rack on more debt in the balance sheet but what happens if say we have a catalyst a reason for the equity value for these companies to drop say tightening tapering and now we have retail investors and institutions alike booking profits from these garbage companies these garbage companies will not be able to meet their obligations because they took on more debt with the assumption that the equity value will offer a cover-up. But we know from the beginning that the equity value is fugazi. It will go down the moment the Fed tightens, leaving these companies with a massive stash of debt and no way to pay back. Some of these companies, their stocks and bonds are bundled up 
in ETFs, and the ETFs look pristine on paper, but there are hidden bombs within these ETFs. If these companies collapse, they could take down the entire ETF down with them. Just one idea among many, but we have to pinpoint where the risk is. Where is the hidden accelerator in that massive stash? So let's visit some ideas here, but let's start with the obvious, the stash, the massive stash of risk. When you read headlines like this, Americans are holding a record amount of their portfolios in stocks surpassing the dot-com bubble levels. When you read headlines like this, some young influencers promoting financial products on social media are pulling in over $500,000, more than junior bankers with $100,000 starting salaries. When you look at the facts, the margin debt is off the charts. The biggest insanity, the biggest orgy in the history of humanity. This is the stash. What are you looking at right now? When there is excess, there is a collapse. Where is the hidden accelerator? Because I don't think we will wait till the Fed is forced to raise interest rates and then the stash will light up in fire. This explanation seems to be more obvious to me. I think it will be a surprise element that will catch everybody off guard. When we try to pinpoint the risk, what about corporate debt, for example? We have the highest corporate debt level in history. Corporations are taking debt like never before, taking advantage of low interest rates and accommodative policy from the Fed. And for now, they say it's a mountain, but it's not a volcano. Weakening U.S. economy threatens swelling corporate debt mountain. Everybody talks about the mountain, but the mountain will catch up on fire if the economy weakens and inflation continues to rise higher, forcing the Fed to tighten. This is the spark that will lead to the fire. Recent U.S. jobs and inflation data show signs of a slowdown in economic recovery, which could lead to a drop in corporate revenues. The Federal Reserve is also poised to tighten its ultra-loose monetary policy in the coming months, leading to a possible increase in borrowing costs. The twin threats could erode companies' ability to invest in growth and make interest payments as corporate debt levels climb even higher, economists and analysts said. The record high corporate debt leverage is a main concern, as much of it has been speculative grade, and it is still a bumpy road to recovery for some sectors. Corporate debt loads could become unbearable for the companies that carry them if the recovery in revenues starts to frizzle. Ratings has warned. Rated U.S. companies issued $2.1 trillion in bonds during 2020 to make up for the pandemic-induced shortfall in revenues, according to LCD. The record annual total was up to 59.7% from the 2019 figure. Companies have continued to issue bonds at historically elevated levels in 2021, reaching $1.4 trillion as of September 15th. The debt buildup left companies well-capitalized, helping grow M&A capital expenditure and spending on share buybacks and dividends in 2021. We haven't learned anything, folks. They're using the extra money to buy back stocks. And we now know that this is a losing strategy. They bought trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of their shares, the stocks, and the market crashed anyways when we got hit with the pandemic. They're not using this cash, this excess liquidity, for a rainy day. No, they're not. Of course not. They're buying shares again. They're spending it on corporate bonuses, executive bonuses, and they're always going to depend that if there is a disaster, the taxpayer will flip the bill once again. Debt runs higher, economic growth weakens. The willingness of investors to continue to back companies is not limitless. But for now, they seem unperturbed by the buildup of debt, experts say. Clearly, there is a point when credit investors will transfer transform into credit vigilantes should corporations become too greedy in their use of credit. But we think that it is far off an investment-grade land, at least for now. By kicking the can down the road, companies risk pushing up the amount of non-financial rated debt quickly from $570 billion in 2022 to a peak of $968.5 billion in 2025. Meanwhile, signs of a slowing recovery are emerging. High inflation and weak jobs data led PIMCO to downgrade its U.S. GDP growth forecast for the third quarter to 3% quarter over quarter from six and a half percent previously. More than half, 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 whatever it is the previous estimate. We have the New York Fed, the Atlanta Fed pretty much waving the white flag. We're not going to forecast GDP anymore. We have no freaking clue at all. So again, the economy is forecasted to weaken. Meanwhile, what about inflation? Core consumer price inflation, which excludes food and energy prices, rose 4% year 
over a year in August, eating into household buying power. U.S. jobs growth also disappointed in August, with just 235,000 jobs added against expectations of $750,000. So once again, this is the risk from corporate debt. What about junk bonds? Junk debt sales soared toward record year. And of course, we have investors and market participants alike going crazy. No rationale at all. Buying junk debt. The worse, the better. And we know when it comes to bundling, they're bundling the good, the bad, and the ugly all together. With the assumption that the Fed, the sugar daddy, will have to buy all of these junk bonds out of their hand. What if this assumption is wrong? What if the accelerator is hiding in plain sight in the junk bond market. And what about zombie companies? The share of zombie companies is growing higher and higher and higher. And we know that we have non-financial corporate debt is due to mature in 2022, 2023, and beyond, increasingly in the non-investment grade, meaning junk bonds, garbage bonds. Will these companies be able to meet their obligations? My assumption is they will not, specifically if the Fed is not accommodative anymore due to rising inflation. Matter of fact, when we look at zombie companies, we have 7.4% of real estate firms right now are zombies, 5.9% in healthcare, 5.5% in telecommunications and media, and 5.1% in travel and tourism. These are zombie companies. How are they going to survive here? Now, these ratios look small to you, but remember, when it came to the financial crisis, the housing bubble in 2005, all the way to the collapse in 2008, 2009, all what it took is 8% default rate in these mortgage bonds. That's all it takes. 8% and the entire house of cards collapses. What if the accelerator is coming out of deleveraging? You risk the mechanical deallocating, degrossing flows in coming days. Heading into this week, meaning last week, the allocation of U.S. equities among volatility-linked funds was nearing historic highs, powered by relentless market records and lowered realized price swings. Now, China debt risks are rocketing Wall Street, just as options show traders preparing for a big pullback. Still, nothing is ever simple in quant investing. While McElliott notes quant funds have an outside exposure to stocks, douche bank analysis shows their overall equity bets are well below recent peaks. Stock positioning for commodity trading advisors, for example, is lower than at the start of the year, according to a weekly positioning note published on Friday. CTAs are unlikely to notably deleverage until we see stocks and bonds moving down together. Pay attention now. CTA strategies tend to look across asset classes. So if you have bonds and equities falling at the same time, this is when you trigger stop losses and unwinding, he said. At this stage, the bond market has stayed fairly resilient simply because the Fed is still buying. What happens when the Fed stops buying? Have you ever heard of tapering? Again, if stocks and bonds fall together, let's say yields start to spike up higher, and we have the TLT bonds going down, and we have the stock market going down due to an explosive move in yields, what happens then? We're going to have the forced deleveraging to the tune of over $40 billion all at once. And that leads me to the last point of discussion today, which is the Dow theory. The Dow theory says, that there is an accumulation phase followed by the public participation phase. You see, in the accumulation phase, we have the so-called smart money, the institutions buying, and then we have the rally. The public notices the rally, and they start hopping on the ride. And stocks continue to go higher and higher and higher. Everybody feels good. There is no end in sight. The music will continue to go on and on and on. And then we have an excess period, the last hurrah. And once again, where there is excess, there is a collapse. And after the public participation, participation period is over, we have the distribution phase. And in the distribution phase, we have the late entrance from the public participants, and they buy from the hands of sellers. The sellers are the institutionals, the big shots, the insiders, the Waltons, the Zuckerbergs, the Tim Cooks of the world are selling you their shares. And we will look into insider activities in another video. But we have elevated levels of insider selling from corporate executives. Meanwhile, we have retail investors buying the dip over and over and over again.
And here it is in a nutshell, just in case you didn't get what I just said, we have the accumulation distribution phase, a massive crash in the market, just like we saw before. And then we have a primary trend after the institutions, the smart money already bought. Then we have the public participation after we make higher highs, the market hits all time highs, everybody feels safe and they start buying again. And then we move on to the excess slash distribution phase. And I'm going to read for you here regarding the Charles Dow theory from Texas technical analyst Fred McAllen. And I posted this on my Twitter page, by the way, and it talks about the distribution phase and market tops. Some say it is harder to call market tops the market bottoms. That is somewhat true, but a market top always has certain characteristics that can be recognized. Market tops form after a long advance. The market seems to get tired and stops advancing and begins to move sideways. The market stops making newer highs or new highs. It no longer has the momentum to push higher, so it starts trading sideways and then begins to roll over. Volume dries up, but a market tops the heavier volume trading days are days when the market is selling off, closing lower. On days when the market moves back up, the volume is light. This tells you that the big money is not buying. They may not be selling, but they aren't buying. They may be waiting for the opportune time to sell. Margin debt reaches extremely high levels. That's right. Historically, the market tops out and starts hitting down when everyone is in. In 1929, people would borrow money to buy stocks. Some even borrowed against their home. During the fast few market tops, the margin debt was at nosebleed levels. Investors and traders were borrowing against the stock they already owned to buy more stock. Not a smart thing to do, but they believed the hype that the market would continue to go higher and they became greedy, wanting to make more money. Euphoria. Euphoria is another characteristic of a market top. I'm sure you can remember when the internet bubble was about to implode. There were wild claims that stock prices were going much higher. Analysts were issuing strong buy recommendations on stock of companies that had never turned a profit. Margin debt was at all-time high levels, and this list goes on and on and on. Over a century ago, Jesse Livemore, probably the best trader of all time, said nothing ever changes. He was right. That was true in 1929, right before the crash, and every market top since that time, including 2000, 2007, and every subsequent market top that will catch investors unaware. That is classic for the distribution phase for market cycle. John Q. Public, the small investor is buying and the Rothschilds of the world are selling to him. That is why this phase is so accurately named. Stocks are being distributed out of the hands of the pros into the hands of the small investor who is unaware and will suffer the loss when the market declines. Let's look at the reality here of what's going on. What happened this week? The market dropped down big, about 5%, and the dips were bought. Bought by who? Retail traders rode to the rescue, bought $1.9 billion of stocks. The data suggests that retail investors are still taking advantage of weakness in the broader market, particularly in mega cap stocks to increase their holdings in spite of a jump in volatility. Large U.S. investment banks were also among the most bought companies, while bigger institutional investors, pay attention now, while bigger institutional investors were likely selling. Ta da Matter of fact, global equity funds see their first outflow in 2021, according to Bank of America. Yet retail investors stick to dip buying. Bet Wall Street's pessimism is wrong. Why? Because stocks only go up. People sometimes act like I'm nuts when I say stocks only go up. But if you take a long-term view, they truly only go up. Of course, this somebody needs a lesson in market history. And as you can see, margin debt already off the charts. So we have all the characteristics here of a market top. We have retail buying institutional selling. We have record high nosebleed levels of margin debt. And on top of that, as of late, the volume spikes up higher on down days and then goes down on up days. And perhaps this is what we're seeing right now in the market when we apply the Charles Dow theory. We had a massive scare, a massive dump when the pandemic hit. And then we had, of course, the Fed to the rescue, ushering the tsunami of liquidity. Who was buying back then? Was it retail investors? Of course not, because they were scared. The coronavirus, the shutdowns, the market will continue to crash. It was smart money, the institutionals and the insiders buying. And then we had a mini accumulation period where retail investors jumped in and they bought Tesla and Apple, ARK Invest, all of these tech 
sexy names. And we witnessed the surge, the rally in the NASDAQ. And then we got another accumulation phase where smart money was buying what? Buying the IWM, the reopening names, the cyclical trade in anticipation of a Biden win, and the rise in inflation coming hand in hand with the vaccines and the economic recovery. After the elections, we have perhaps the main public participation phase where the public is buying stocks. And now the question is, are we getting into the distribution phase where we have yet another batch of retail traders and investors who perhaps missed the boat and now they're buying the dips? But who is selling them those stocks? It's the insiders, the institutionals, the smart money that bought at the bottom, and they're up over 100% since then. And of course, I'm not worried about the Charles Dow theory. I'm more worried about the Charles Darwin theory, because we have certain retail traders and investors who solemnly believe that the dips should be bought, the market will continue to go higher, stocks only go up, the Fed got our back, and it will never end. We will see how different this one indeed. But for now, we're moving on to the market's coverage and how the market performed in the week that was. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closed in the green by 33.18 points or a rise of 0.10%. The Nasdaq closed in the red down 4.55 points or a decline of 0.03%. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 6.5 points or a gain of 0.15%. And here are the sectors that led the week. At number one in capturing the gold medal energy. And at number two for the silver financials. Number three for the bronze industrials. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by materials, utilities, and REITs. Somewhat of a mixed picture here because you have the cyclical trade, the inflationary trade of energy, financials, and industrials leading the market, but absent from that, materials. Likewise, when we talk about the defensives, utilities, REITs are down, but you also have tech trading higher, even though yields also popping higher. So we have somewhat of a mixed picture here, and this will be resolved in the upcoming week. What about the advanced to decline ratio? We talked about the peak in the advanced to decline ratio. When we reach 80% advancing, you're gonna go back to neutral ground of a 50-50 split. And this is exactly what we got on Friday. The NYSE, we have 43% advancing versus 55% declining. The NASDAQ, 40% advancing versus 55% declining. What about futures? What's going on here? On Friday, despite the rise of the US dollar, we still have outperformance in energy futures with crude oil prices rising higher. We have gains of about 1% apiece for both the WTI and Brent. Meanwhile, well, natural gas prices rebounding higher again, resuming the rally as we have anticipated in this channel. What about softs? We have mixed picture here, declines for sugar, OJ, and cocoa. Meanwhile, gains for lumber, coffee, and cotton. Of course, cotton futures are surging higher. And we have more appetite here from traders in buying cotton futures. Is there a real catalyst for cotton futures to rise higher? Not really. But again, when you have money printing out of thin air, the money has to chase something, and it is chasing commodities, so long as the Fed is allowing inflation to rise higher. Shifting from crude to natural gas to coffee to cotton, money will find some place to hide. And the best place to hide here is commodities. What about metals? Mixed picture with the, the only gainers, Dr. Copper. Gold closing at the flat line, but we have losses here from platinum, palladium, and silver. What about meats? We have live and feeder cattle futures pretty much closing at the flat line, while lean hogs futures scoring more gains. What about grains? Mixed picture, we have losses for oats, corn, soybean meal futures. Meanwhile, soybeans futures closing at the flat line, while we have gains here for canola, wheat, and soybean oil futures. I did buy soybean oil futures on Friday, and I'm betting on a bounce here. I believe that the losses, the negative momentum is over, we will see a rebound in soybean oil futures. What about the big casino, the options market? What's going on here? At number one, take a look at this one, Tesla with about 1.6 million contracts. About 51% of those were calls. A massive surge in Tesla call options, specifically on Friday. Why? Do we have a catalyst here? Who knows? Perhaps it is on the heels of comments from Elon Musk urging the Biden administration to boost fuel economy penalties because Tesla will make money from other companies buying environmental credits from Tesla. So my question is, what happened here, Reverend Elon? Because last quarter, we got the first 
profitable quarter in Tesla's history for making cars. Now all of a sudden he wants to go back to environmental credits. What's going on here? Trouble with the business, Elon? I don't know. But perhaps the optimism was on the heels of comments from Elon saying that the chip shortage is a short-term problem. Of course, you take whatever Elon says with a grain of salt because he made imp empty promises before of the robo-taxis coming in 2019, yada, yada, yada. Or it could be on the heels of this news that Reverend Elon Musk is finally single and ready to mingle because he apparently broke up with his girlfriend Grimes because she lives in LA and he lives in Texas and the distance is no bueno. Others say that Grimes is the one who broke up with the Rev because perhaps he finally realized that Reverend Elon Musk has a notorious reputation of being cheap. So yes, she got the right sugar daddy, the richest man in the world, but he happened to be cheap. He wears the same clothes every day. He wears company t-shirts with coffee stains on them. And of course, at some point, you got to realize that you got the wrong sugar daddy. Even though Grimes went to extent length to please her sugar daddy, the Rev Elon Musk, by getting scars tattoos on her back in hope that such weird tattoos will turn the Rev's ludicrous mode on. But apparently this didn't happen either, and therefore perhaps Elon Musk is better off with a Martian girl. Or perhaps the options traders are betting that they will be the next Mrs. Elon Musk because they're buying an enormous amount of calls. Anyhow, at number two, we have Apple with about 950,000 contracts, about 61% of those were calls. At number three, not AMC, AMC is dropping, but we have Ford at number three, and the implied volatility in Ford is rising with about 640,000 contracts, about 38% of those were calls. So the majority are betting against Ford, but they're betting for Tesla. Do we have some pending news here beside the Rev being single? We'll see. What about the implied volatility? Because this is an important factor that we have to consider in our options trading strategy. As you can see, the IV percentage went higher for Tesla from about 4% last week to about 8% now. Therefore, the premiums are appreciating. I do believe that we have a massive move to come here in Tesla. So this IV percentage will shoot up higher. Likewise, when we look at names like Alibaba, for example, the IV percentage is about 98%. What does that mean? Perhaps we have a top. A top in what? In the stock? Because the stock has been crashing as of late. Nope. We have a top in implied volatility. What does that mean? The stock has been getting crushed week after week, day after day, months over months. And now we have 98% of days in the last year where the implied volatility was lower than the current implied volatility in Alibaba, which perhaps means that we have a bottom in Alibaba. We'll see. And I'm willing to go along here and buy some call options on Baba, but I will never buy the stock. I warned you guys last year, don't buy the dip in Baba. There are more troubles here. Some of you did not listen and you caught a falling knife. So you got to be careful here because we could have another shoot or drop here from the Chinese Communist Party. You play this via call options because you have no idea if the stock will rebound or not. We're moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. And again, no significant moves here. Options traders remain hesitant. They're buying short-term options with expiration dates that range from weekly expirations to perhaps a few weeks from now max. This demonstrates the lack of certainty and conviction among options traders. So we have some people who say in the comments that you give us these lists after the fact, after the trades already happened and we cannot follow the trades, the moves already happened. What is the point of showing us these trades? Hold your horses here. Perhaps you are a new viewer because we haven't seen this kind of action until now. Usually we have trades with expiration dates that range from 20 to 30 to a few months and you have plenty of time to follow the trade. You're better off actually watching how the trade plays out before deciding whether to join the trade or not. But for now, the majority of trades are extremely short term because we have lack of conviction. Do you really want to follow these trades or are you just going to watch how they turn out to be? And I'm highlighting here plenty of trades, but I'm just going to go over three of them in the interest of time because we're running out of time here. What about the ticker ARKK for ARK Invest, Tesla Witch, Kathy Wood? They're betting for more declines to come here. We've been in consolidation range, but RKK is not moving higher. And Mama Kathy's making a lot of mistakes here, being a day trader, selling and buying and selling 
coming and buying and buying garbage, buying the dips in Robinhood and Coinbase, and this is firing back so far. In this case, they're buying the 106 puts with the expiration date of October 15th, with expectations that the RKK will drop by more than 9.5% by then. They paid about a buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $2 million. What about the trade for the ticker TSLA Tesla? They're making a bearish bet here, which comes hand in hand with the bet against RKK, even though Kathy Wood lightened up her exposure to Tesla as of late. Not by a lot, Tesla remains the largest position in RKK, but regardless, they're betting against Tesla here too by buying the 725 puts with the expiration date of October 8th. With expectations that Tesla will drop by more than 6% by then, they paid about 10 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $8 million. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker AFRM, Affirm? The stock has been on fire after the news that Amazon is adopting Affirm services for the pay now, excuse me, buy now, pay later, or pay never program. Of course, the stock shot up higher on the heels of a massive short squeeze, and the likelihood is the short squeeze will continue because including a firm in Amazon's transaction, transactions will probably shoot up the revenue by three to four folds. You don't want to fight this one. And therefore, they're buying calls, the 135 calls, the expiration date of October 1st, with expectations that a firm will ride another 10% higher. They paid about two bucks and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one and a half million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis this is the weekly heat map is there a theme here not really we have at performance from the inflationary side of the market but not all of them financials are riding higher on the heels of yields rising higher likewise energy prices excuse me energy stocks rising higher on the heels of the rise in energy prices but absent from the rally industrials and materials not participating at all but we have another block of the so-called inflationary cyclical trade, the reopening names, the likes of travel names, airlines, casinos, hotels, all at performing this week. Meanwhile, we have underperformance from the big cap technology names, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon. This is not good news for the market. You want these names to also rally higher because they can single-handedly carry the market higher. But the losses here were led by earnings news or individual company news. We have Adobe down due to earnings. We have Coinbase down due to the news of the Chinese crackdown. We have Zoom continues to collapse along with Zillow. This is another name that I'm shorting and the name is down big. Why? Because yields are rising higher. And the likelihood is you will see the residentials, the DR Hortons of the world, also collapsing if yields continue to rise higher. Disney down due to the company downgrading the streaming forecast. Likewise, we have massive losses here in the Chinese names Alibaba, Pindudu, JD, Li Odo, Neo. And now we have somewhat of a contagious effect if you're paying attention because Nike's down. Nike down about 4% for the week. And they're downgrading their forecast due, due to a weakness in China. So the weakness in the Chinese market, forget about Evergrande. This could be contained via bailouts from the government, more injections of liquidity into banks. But what will happen as a result? A weakness in the Chinese economy. Weakness in the Chinese economy will not be good for cyclicals. It will not be good for large American names. American companies, the likes of Nike, Starbucks, Yum Brands, Apple, all of these companies are highly dependent on a robust Chinese economy. And this is not what we're getting so far. Moving on to charts, and let's talk about a dead cat bounce, because you're hearing this term over and over and over again dead cat bounce. What we're seeing right now is the dead cat bounce. What does that mean? This is what it means. We have a massive move down, a big gap due to whatever news, in this case, Evergrande. And then we have a 50% retracement to the move, and then the market reverses and it continues to downtrend. This is the classic definition of a dead cat bounce. So let's see what's going on here with the SPY, for example. Are we seeing a dead cat bounce? We have a massive down move here, rapidly, losses of about 5% or so, and the SPY all in all was down about 20 points, top to bottom. Let's see what happened after that. A rebound higher by about 10 points. So right now, 
we are precisely at the 50% retracement. If the chart starts to pull down once again, then we have a dead cat bounce. But for now, we have calls that this will be a dead cat bounce, but we have yet to have a confirmation. What's going on with the 30 minutes chart? Again, the chart is fixing some of the stretch conditions in the momentum indicators, the MACD and the RSI, by consolidating for a little while. We saw a gap down on Friday. That dip was bought again, and the chart closed above 440 three the support and we're eyeing 447 which happens to be the resistance but also the gap this becomes sort of a natural conclusion everybody's eyeing the gap everybody's eyeing 447 and the likelihood is they will try to go there probably overnight via the futures or in the morning by gapping higher but what happens after that if we have a retracement a rejection from 447 then perhaps the dead cat bounce is in play now what is the difference between this gap down and previous gap downs on the chart because the bulls would say wait a minute here we have seen gap downs before in this chart over and over and over again every dip is bought and every dip is a bear trap what makes this one different perhaps here's an explanation yes every time we got a gap down the market rebounded higher aggressively the dips have been getting bought over and over and over again but we have maintained the trend we have maintained higher lows and higher highs this time around the chart broke in the trend we have a lower low and perhaps a lower high. This is a classic break in the trend and it makes it extremely difficult to recapture the trend once again as if nothing happened. And that leads us to the daily chart for the continuous contract. As I'm looking right now, the futures are trading higher and perhaps they will do the work overnight by trying to reclimb the trend line once again. But the break is evident here and the likelihood is you will face resistance at the trend line. The bulls want to see a recapture the trend line the bears want to see a rejection at the trend line and a reversal the ideal scenario for the bears is a gap higher in the morning reaching the trend line and then the market flushes down anyways the ideal scenario for the bulls is a gap down and then the dips are bought once again and therefore we have solid evidence that the market has the strength and the momentum to climb higher so it's a little bit of a contrarian thinking here the bulls are looking at the futures and jerking off the bears are looking at the futures and they're grabbing the tissue paper. But the ideal scenario for the bears is a gap higher and a rejection. Meanwhile, the ideal scenario for the bulls is a gap down and buy the dip once again. Moving on to the queues, what's going on here? The queues will be a lot weaker than the SPY due to the rise in the 10 year treasury yield. We had somewhat of a wedge pattern. The chart broke in the wedge as expected, diving below 372, but climbing higher by the end of the day, closing the gap and closing above 372. For now, the assumption is if the market continues to grind up higher, the queues will close the original gap once and for all and perhaps rise all the way to the next resistance level around 378 and a half. I doubt that the queues will do that so long as yields continue to rise higher. Yet if the pop in yields turns out to be transitory, then the Nasdaq will be able to climb higher because traders will find the opportunity in big cap technology names, the likes of Apple, etc. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract on the Nasdaq? Again, the rebound continues off oversold conditions, but where is the next resistance? For that, we look at the intraday chart for the queues. But for now, the momentum indicators on the daily chart for the futures are recovering, yet still in negative divergence territory. And we have theories here that perhaps what we're seeing right now is a formation of a head and shoulder pattern. And then we will see the NASDAQ breaking 15,000 once and for all and diving down. Again, the leading indicator for this chart will be the action in the 10 year treasury yield what about the iwm what's going on here gapping down in the morning on friday and failing to close the gap reversing before closing the gap this is usually not a good sign but the good news here is that the iwm is still trading above the support of 223 again you will see some excitement here in the reopening trade the airlines, the casinos, the hotels, the cruises. Why? Because we have institutionals buying these names. The retail traders are buying big cap technology names. But the smart money is selling their tech exposure and they're buying the reopening names once again. Why? Perhaps on the heels of Delta peaking and the normalization of activities in the economy, which will support the travel names, cruises, hotels, etc. If the theory is right here, then we will see 223 holding 
and the IWM given it another shot, closing the gap and trading higher for the resistance at 229. If they're wrong and the weakness will happen either way, whether Delta peaks or not, because we're moving on from the reopening of the summer to the normalization of the economy, meaning going back to work in the fall to winter season, then the positive sentiment regarding the reopening name will fade away and the Russell 2000, the IWM, will break the support of 223. What about the Dixie, the dollar index, perhaps the most important chart to watch? Again, yo-yoing back and forth, climbing higher, closing higher on Friday. So once again, we have no conclusion. We have no supportive evidence of the rally, the bounce higher, specifically in the inflationary names, the energy, industrials, and materials, so long as the dollar continues to trade above 93. If the dollar flushes down below 93, then we we have a confirmation here that perhaps you want to join the cyclical slash inflationary trade of industrials, energy, and materials. What about gold? What's going on here with gold? Still looking weak, not looking good at all. And if the dollar continues to rise hand in hand with the yields, we're going to have a big problem here in the chart of gold. Again, going back all the way to 1,685. And here it is, the second most important chart to watch, the chart of the 10-year treasury yield facing some resistance here in the resistance zone but closing higher above 1.45 percent and if the pop continues we will see 1.5 perhaps 1.6 and at some point around 1.6 1.7 the market will start to freak out and the rise in treasury yields is doing the tightening before the fed does the tightening and therefore the risk on technology growth momentum trade will suffer tremendously but the rise in yields is supportive for what? Financials. So again, you have to keep an eye on financials, energy, industrials, and materials. If yields continue to climb higher and the dollar flattens and starts to trade down, we have a confirmation that the inflationary trade is bueno once again. And here's, of course, the correlation between the rise in yields and the performance of the big cap technology names, the FANG stocks. When yields rise higher, the FANG names that carry the most weighting, by the way, in the NASDAQ and the SPY, underperform. So there is a limit here to how high the market can tolerate when it comes to yields. And by the way, here's the chart of the TLT weekly chart. Not looking so good here. Perhaps this is a reversal candle. We will see more weakness in the TLT in the days and weeks to come. Still within the consolidation range so I am hesitant to call a top here in the move in the TLT but it is starting to look like that what about the VIX what's going on here four hours chart the moment you saw the crossing in the MACD indicator creating red columns on the histogram you knew right away the SPY will bottom and it will start to trade higher the moment the VIX chart the four hours chart on the MACD indicator starts to curl back higher creating green impressions in the histogram then you'll know that the pop the bounce the rebound the dead cat bounce whatever you want to call it is over in the SPY what about Apple still within the bear flag formation when does the bear flag goes out of the window if the chart closes above the breakdown candle, the highs of the breakdown candle, which happens to be at 149. Absent of that, the assumption is that the bear flag will materialize and we will see Apple dropping down to the target of a 15% correction from the top. What about Tesla bucking the trend, trading higher, at performing pretty much everything, including the big cap technology names? We saw a gap down, not quite to 742, the target that we were eyeing, but close enough gathering that energy and closing above the resistance of the gap and not looking back. What is the chart eyeing, by the way? It is eyeing the resistance around 781, 782. It becomes like a magnet and the chart has to visit that resistance level first before the sellers show up. But perhaps the most important chart to watch in Tesla here is the weekly chart because we have a bear flag formation in the weekly. Yes, the MACD indicator, the momentum is getting better and the negative momentum has already topped we have the start of positive momentum. If we have a bear flag and the positive momentum will weaken and reverse back to negative momentum, then the assumption is we're going to have a drop as much as the pull of the flag, which happens to be another drop here, all the way back to the range of 300 to 400, the former consolidation range. When do we know that the bear flag is dead on the weekly? And perhaps we will have higher highs in Tesla. If the chart closes above 781, 782 on the weekly, and it continues to climb higher. So closing above 785, preferably, 
above 800 will be a confirmation. The watch out here. We're not done with the mania. What about BTC? Massive bombs were dropped on BTC tulips from the Chinese crackdown to the imminent crackdown from the SEC, yet the chart continues to be resilient. For now, we are at the phase of retesting 42,000 in some charts, 40,000. We're retesting it over and over and over and over again. The assumption is the retesting will fail, but how do you know if the retest is done and we're good to go higher? When the chart closes above the breakdown candle, the highs of the breakdown candle, around 47,000. 359. If the chart indeed closes above that number, then we have a solid, very solid buy signal. Why? The chart is a Teflon right now. It got shot from every angle. It retested 42,000, 40,000, whatever number you have, and it climbed higher anyways, closing above the breakdown candle high. But absent of that, the assumption is the chart will continue to break down. Lastly, what about AMC weekly chart? And the assumption among the bulls, or shall we say the apes, was that this is a formation of an ABC pattern. Yes, we dropped down, but this is an ABC pattern, and AMC will shoot up higher again. But I told you back then, the Twin Peaks is the top, and I got a lot of hate from the apes, but so far, the Twin Peaks is the top, and the top was never touched. So are we really seeing an ABC pattern higher, or do we have a failure to cross on the MACD indicator from the weekly? And therefore, what we're seeing here is a spike top, followed by a reverse ABC pattern, which will lead the chart all the way down to break the support of 32, which is the most important support to hold. For now, this is the assumption. AMC needs a massive catalyst here to reverse this fate. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar next week? On Monday, we have durable goods. On Tuesday, September 28th, we have the Case Chiller Home Price Index year over year. This will be insignificant. We already know that we have the biggest jump year over year in history. We also have the Consumer Confidence Index. On Wednesday, we have pending home sales. On Thursday, September 30th, we have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims, but perhaps most importantly, the Chicago PMI. And lastly, on October 1st, Friday, we will have real disposable income, real consumer spending, core inflation, along with the manufacturing PMI, and the ISM Manufacturing Index. On top of that, we have Construction Spending and the Consumer Sentiment Index, the final reading. So Friday will be slightly important, but all in all, not an important week from a macro perspective. This week, the real test is the sentiment. Are we going to see retail investors and traders buying the dip once again, continuing to buy the dip, pushing the indices higher? Or are we going to have another scare that would formulate the dead cat bounce theory that this is just a mere bounce due to oversold technical conditions and we will reverse back again? What would be the catalyst for the reversal, the bad news? It could be anywhere from the wall of worry. A highly critical week when it comes to sentiment, a real test the sentiment between bulls and bears. Who is going to give up first? Will it be the bulls? Will it be the bears? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.